the six and seven figure show episode 56 let's hit it broadcasting from the valley of the sun outside phoenix arizona this is the six to seven figure show tired of working so hard and having no time take your six figure practice and turn it to a thriving seven figure enterprise and now your host author speaker mentor and strategist frank bria Hey everyone, welcome to the Six and Seven Figure Show. I am your host, Frank Bria, and today I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by my guest, Chris Ronzio, who's the founder and CEO of Trainual, a leading SaaS company that helps fast-growing businesses automate their onboarding and training by documenting every process, policy, and procedure in one simple, searchable, teachable system. And uh, after helping hundreds of entrepreneurs create scalable systems and processes with his consulting firm. He started back in uh, 2013 called Organize Chaos. Chris developed a passion for helping business leaders find the time to do more of what they love by providing a, to, a way to document and delegate what they do. Chris the, is the author of 100 Hacks to Improve Your Business, as well as The Process Playbook, a weekly Inc. magazine column as a serial entrepreneur and startup leader he built and sold a nationwide video production company before the age of 25. And he's invested in building six businesses to over 30 million in annual revenue. Uh, now with Trainual, uh, Chris is on a mission to make small business easier by automating training manuals for busy, co- busy companies around the world. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What an intro. That was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done a lot, so there's a lot to say. Um, exactly. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, also in the Arizona area, we were just talking about this before the show. It, like Chris is basically a neighbor now, <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> like right down the street, miles apart. Yeah, that's right. For those of us who live in Scottsdale uh, or uh, Northern Phoenix, it's even even bigger. People say Phoenix, and it could be like a hundred miles away. Right. <laughs> so, right. Uh, very cool. So um, the this this mix of software. And uh, training, uh, you know, people are kind of familiar, I guess, with that from the standpoint of like, you know, online training, uh, 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 learning management systems and things like this. But you guys have taken this in a different direction. Um, This is about sort of documentation, which I don't think a lot of people would have immediately thought software for. Where did that idea come from? Yeah, it's, it's definitely more about getting what you have inside your head out of your head and into a place where you can communicate it with other people. And I think the traditional learning training thing is about let's make a course and broadcast it out to the world. And it's definitely not that. So this evolved just out of my own experience. Like you mentioned in the intro, I had a video production company that was filming youth sporting events around the United States. And so we had a few hundred camera operators that we had to get up to speed teach our system to ship gear out to and be confident that they could execute the event and then ship everything back and 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 so we could fulfill all the orders and so it became kind of like a second nature thing that we were onboarding people and training and writing standard operating procedures and laminated checklists and all this stuff so as that business developed i got into some entrepreneurship groups and i was telling other people what i'm doing running my business at that time remotely from scottsdale with stuff happening around the country and everyone's like, I want that. I want to do that. I want a playbook. I want a, I want a system. And I kept hearing those terms over and over. So that kind of evolved into the operations consulting work I was doing, working with a bunch of different companies. And what I saw every time is we would tear apart someone's workflow and we'd try to build some structure around how they did what they did. And we'd put new tech in place. And at the end of the project, the owner or the manager, the leader would always say, great, can you write up the instructions or can you do a training day with all my people or can we put this up on the big screen and shark can you record some videos and it, it, it this theme started to build where it was like we would create something but then they wanted to know that they had this finite you know recorded documented structure to go with the thing that we had created so it yeah. stuck and uh, and that's really where the idea came from yeah, that's, uh, it, I think people who have not quite gone through the work of putting a playbook together <laughs> uh, don't appreciate what you've just done there. And the, the, that element of being able to automate the whole process of getting that, uh, that, that's amazing. I would have thought, I guess, 
that that would have been a bit of like magic every time you guys sat down with people to download this. But, uh, but, but there really is sort of a, Hey, we just kind of do this every time uh, to, to download this information. I mean, you must have to turn it into software. Yeah, there's, there's two sides to the coin, you know, there's the extraction or the documentation. And that's what I was doing with consulting. I'd sit face to face with someone, I'd ask them a ton of questions. And then I'm just prodding and trying to pull out the knowledge that I can then piece back together in a process. And so the system does that. But then on the flip side, it's like, once we write this down somewhere, we've got to give it to someone and make it easy to consume and understand and track that they did it. And so when you put those two things together, it makes a pretty cool process. And that's, yeah. that's what we, we did with the software. Yeah, that's brilliant. What kinds of companies uh, are typically using the software sizes, industries? Can you give a, a sense of your user base at this point? Sure. So it's industries, it's all over, all over the board. Size of company is really what matters. And we tend to see companies that are probably greater than 10 people on the team, or at least greater than 10 contractors or field employees or, or subcontract, whoever it is. But yeah. you've got at least this, this repetition of we've got a few people doing the same thing and we want to make sure they're doing it the same way. So that's kind of the entry point. If you're just starting out and you're kind of experimenting and trying to, to, you know, figure out the best way to do things, then it's not time to write things down yet. You know, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're doing something different every day. So writing it down would actually be a huge waste of time. Yeah. But once you've got the repetition, then you want to start, you know, to put it in concrete. And then on the upper end, I mean, we've got organizations with tens of thousands of people, but they'll just, they'll, they'll adopt it for a certain department or a certain project, or they're, they're scaling their sales team and they want to use it for that. Or they've got this new, um, you know, thing that they're licensing and they want to train all their licensees or the, it's a new franchise product and they want to roll out the franchise playbook. So it could be organizations of kind of all sizes, but it starts once you've got something repeatable. Yeah. Got it. And uh, what are some, like as you've, so, so clearly from your consulting background, you've sat down with a lot of people and kind of gone through the processes. Now the software is like automating a lot of that, but what are this, what are some of the big process mistakes you're seeing companies make that are kind of making it harder for them. And maybe in consulting, you know, you, you actually had to kind of fix for people, uh, yeah. but what are some common things, common themes that you see uh, entrepreneurs kind of stumble into or stumble around with when it comes to process? Well, I think first it's a scary word. You know, you think, yeah. oh, I got to work on my processes. It feels like it's a ton of work. And so you put this burden on yourself, like I've got to sit down and I've got to create all of this from scratch. But really that's not the case. I mean, if you're in business, you're already doing what you're doing. You have a process. And so I tell people process is more about collecting than creating. It's more just, you know, let me, let me get a blank sheet of paper out. And while I'm doing the thing, let me just make some notes of what I was doing. And now all of a sudden I've got a process that's written down. So I think the first thing is don't put so much pressure on yourself that it's got to be this really detailed, crazy thing. It's just a, it's just a sequence really. So that's yeah. the first piece. And, and then the second thing is, you know, people, attack this and they say, oh, I'm going to build the playbook and it's going to take me a couple months. This is my Q3, Q4, whatever project. And, and in reality, it's like, you can't do it alone and this project will never be done. You know, right. it, it's, it's like everyone in your organization knows something different. And it's really about building this into your culture that once we formalize how we do something, let's take the time to just put it in the knowledge base and the bank of knowledge that everybody else has access to. Right. And you've got to do that little by little. So I think those, well, those are the first things. And I would imagine too, that uh, processes evolve, right? As you mm -hmm. kind of go through the process of um, documenting everything, you start to look at, wait, actually, you know, uh, we can be do it this way. We do it this way. And I, and I suspect with, with software, it makes it way easier to kind of go back and tweak things a little bit. Absolutely. It, it's transparent, at least everyone can see it. So we've the process that I teach is, you know, you learn to do it first. And once you're doing it consistently, then you document it. And once you're documenting it clearly, then you can delegate it. And, and it's this repeat cycle where delegating it 
creates this feedback loop of, hey, well, hey, boss, what if we do this? I've got this idea. Great. Let's try that. And let's change how we've written it down. And you're, you're always kind of updating the best practice, but it's got to start somewhere. That, and, and you've just brought up a really good point, which I think a lot of, I see a lot of entrepreneurs making this mistake of delegating too early. Uh, you, you, delegating was the last step of the process, not the first. It was, uh, I know, and I've made this mistake too. I know a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I'm, I'm stuck doing this thing. I don't like doing, it's not my, it's not my bag. It's not my zone of genius, whatever. I'm just going to delegate it, move it off, give it to someone else. And then they're, they're looking for exactly the output that you just described. Okay. What, yeah. how is this done? And if you haven't taken the time to really think through exactly what it is that you want and how it's supposed to be done and you know, what your preferences are. I, I, I mean, it sounds dumb, but I, we, we talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who kind of say, you know, it was, it was weird. Like our, the employee just, she, you know, she just couldn't get up to speed and come to realize it's like, because you wanted something of like 14 point font and never bothered to tell anybody. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> it's like, if you, if you delegate before you've, documented, then you're asking someone to do something without instructions, right? You know, like, would you ask someone, would you give them the, the box of Ikea furniture and say, Hey, just build this. I'm not going to tell you how, how it works. You'd have some crazy shelf with like weird right angles, but if you give them the instructions, it's really easy. So it's all about expectation. Well, and, and I think the, the challenge is a lot of, a lot of founders are people who don't want the instructions. They want to actually go figure it out themselves but we're kind of a weird breed. <laughs> Not everybody's a founder. Not everyone wants to do that. And even if you do find somebody who is like that, who will break the rules and kind of figure it out yourself, you know, take all the Ikea pieces and build a shelf. That shelf's probably not going to look like what you thought it was going to look like in your head. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the shift that you made from consulting into software. Mm -hmm. um, how did that go? What was, what was the impetus to finally, uh, product productize it, I guess, and, and move things out. So it was a step-by-step -step sequence. It started with consulting where I was kind of a, uh, a fractional COO or a project management team for hire. And we started hiring employees and we were this little boutique firm that would come in and assess all the problems and then fix them with a, with a retainer over a few months. And so little by little, we were implementing different software tools and then we'd work with businesses that would say, Hey, wouldn't it be easier if this just connected to this? And so we would try to connect things off the shelf. And then we had enough of those connection requests that we brought on a developer in house and said, let's just start attaching APIs and streamlining people's workflows to automate more things. And, and then our developer would start working on little custom tools for, for this client or that client. And so Trainual was built along the way as a tool for our own consulting clients. And we thought it'd be cool to have this thing in house that we could use and have something proprietary. And so we built Trainual as like a prototype for our consulting. And then little by little over a few years, we had people asking for Trainual that weren't consulting clients and, and thought, hmm, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity here. So it was, it really just built over time until I saw the, the light bulb that, you know, my wife had seen years before, which is always <laughs> the case. And, uh, and then we went for it. That's like storybook Guy Kawasaki art of the start process. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but those people who are listening, if you take a look at Guy Kawasaki, he's one of the, uh, uh, does, one of the original designer evangelists of Apple now has his own venture capital firm. He has a book called Art of the Start, which actually talks about how to start a software company. And he said, consult, build tools to make things easier, sell the tools. That's brilliant. That's exactly the, the structure. Yeah. Um, I found the playbook. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Right. The process guy's got the process down. I suppose that's a good thing. Um, but, but that's got to be a different kind of company to run than a consulting company. What, what's been different as leader for you, the kinds of things that you're dealing with uh, for a software company versus a consulting company? It's way different. So as a consulting company, the, the biggest change for me was I was selling services that were 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 and more. And the CEOs that I was selling to would sign off on those checks more quickly than they would on a $99 software subscription. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I thought it would be the opposite. I thought if I'm if I'm closing this many deals for fifteen thousand, I'll have a million customers on my software product, and and uh, you know that. Uh, expectation I guess got popped at the the very beginning so so the biggest thing for me the biggest transition has been understanding how to market at scale and how to talk about this product and so we built a marketing team a department that didn't exist in the consulting firm and then it became how do we support customers and teach them about the product and hold their hand through the process instead of us doing the work we need to help them do the work and that became very different where in consulting, it was like, you write a big check and we'll just, you know, fix this problem for you. You go do what you do. In software, you're forced to show someone else how to solve the problem, which is a harder challenge, I think, yeah. but a more scalable one. Well, and, and a couple of things that are really fascinating about this. I, I think that a lot of people, I, I had a little smirk on my face as you were talking about the uh, people not signing the check for $99 or whatever for a month or something for a software subscription versus big consulting is that I think a lot of people who are not in that space would be surprised to hear that. Um, but those of us who have played in the software space know that for some reason that software sale is a harder play. It's a, it's a harder mountain to get someone through. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. When we first launched, it was like, you know, I could get someone to agree to a $10,000 scope of work on email, but then I'd try to tell someone like, we're launching this tool and it's $49 a month at the time. And it would be like, well, let's set up six demos and I want to bring all my team in the room and I don't get it, but it does. It's, it's interesting because uh, software, you know, embeds itself into process inside the company. And I think, um, you know, it, it, in early tech startups that I was in, we couldn't even give the software away for free because people were doing the math about how hard it would be to implement those processes, train people up, get them to use it. And, and we were dumbfounded. We were like, it's free. It's a free trial. Like we're doing this free, you know, pilot. Why, why won't you sign up? And it's actually, no, it's like millions of dollars of effort on their side. Yeah, um, for for the uh, enterprise implementation, and we we weren't thinking about it that way. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, which I think was fascinating as well, is this switch over from consulting to software. You really have to have your ducks in a row. <laughs> I think in a consulting engagement, you can kind of hide a lot of mess. You know, if you don't exactly know the process or you haven't thought through every little thing, you can kind of like well, there'll be hamsters running in a wheel in the back end kind of fixing that stuff. Once you turn that into software, you know, as you talk through the process of making sure your customers are actually getting up to speed and are actually using the software and are having success with it, you kind of have to have this nailed uh, on, on, the, on the process side. Yeah, it's a definitely a volume game. You know, when you're consulting and you've got one client at a time, you can kind of customize things. Yeah. But when you've got a software product that dozens or hundreds or thousands of people are signing up for, um, if you if you can only get one or two people to sign up, you're tempted to go and customize things like you did in consulting. Yeah, and you say, "Let me fix this for you. Let me fix this for you." But you've really got to zoom out and get this macro scale of what's happening, and that's where marketing became so important. Because until we had hundreds of people signing up, it was hard to kind of sift out the common denominators of what we need to focus on. Yeah, I, I mean, have you guys instituted a sort of user request, user meeting, product management roadmap kind of stuff for the software now? Yeah, of course. So we've got a roadmap. It's a public roadmap, so anyone can check it oh, out. Nice. They can uh, make feature requests, and then we update them as we go. We meet weekly as the product team. They do daily huddles, but we do weekly meetings. We do monthly roadmap meetings. We pick the features we're going to work on for the next quarter. So uh, we've got it dialed in now, but not the case at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, and it is very different from consulting. You're right. It's uh, um, in consulting, you are you're tempted to just you have to say yes to as many requests as possible because you have so few relatively few clients in comparison that, you know, you would want to, to be able to do that in software. It's interesting. You kind of have to be almost ahead of the market, but reactive to demand, because if you do all the work for customization and only two people care about it, it's just, it really isn't financially viable. It's and a, you've got to really know your customer, you know, yeah. because in consulting, you can kind of sift and move and, and change and go after this and then this and then this. But in software, you've committed. Like you've built this thing. You need to know who you're building it for. Yep. 
but yeah, that is, that is absolutely true. So there's a lot of people who are listening to this podcast who are um, in, you, you basically want to walk down the path you just went down. In other words, they've got services, they know they're going to productize them eventually, it's gonna, going to become some kind of a software as a service offering. What advice would you give them that someone you wish someone had whispered in your ear <laughs> before you went down this path on your own? <laughs> I would say, you know, start by selling a service as a service instead of a software as a service, you know, figure out how you can package or productize actually doing the work for someone holding their hand through it. And then little by little say, this is, it's just like when you would delegate some service responsibility to someone on your team. If you're repeating the same thing over and over again, think of the software you could build as an employee on your team and say, how do I, how do I reproduce that thing to be more efficient, more effective, have more capacity? And then you can build little tools. So you don't start paying for development and building some crazy thing until you've got a repeatable delivery of something to a bunch of clients and then use software to make yourself more efficient first. So you start, essentially you're starting in a design thinking mode for a while, probably yeah. more than you would think. It's not, you know, just go some weekend to a whiteboard and draw it all out. You want to spend some time really focusing on thinking about things in terms of, you know, what, what component of this would be designed into an automated piece and then slowly build it out that way. Is that, would I understand that right? Yeah. And it's also important to mention, you know, by doing it the way we did it, we bootstrapped the software without taking investors at the beginning and retained, um, you know, massive ownership in the company. Yeah. Whereas if you go and raise a bunch of money to pursue this idea and someone else is financing that design thinking phase, then you're just burning through cash to own less of your own business. Right. So I always recommend you start with being as close to the customer as possible and make money while you're doing it. Yep, that's, that's a really, really good point. And um, is a, a fairly relatively new um, idea from a concept, a business model concept for starting a software company because it, it used to be that was the only thing you would do is you'd go catch a flight to, uh, to uh, the Bay Area and go ask, you know, beg for millions of dollars and then have them do that. And uh, it's a tough road. It's a tough road to have. You know, a lot of people think it's easier to have that money sitting there uh, to, to burn through, but it, it isn't. I can tell you I've been there, done that, and it's not. Uh, having someone else barking over your shoulder going, you know, when's, when's client number one coming out? It, it's not as much fun, I don't think. So yeah. congratulations on executing that model. Thank you. I think instead of flying to Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, you should fly to a customer and get the best case study ever. And it all, you know, it doubles your valuation on day one. Yeah, there you go. Excellent. Uh, Chris, we're out of time. So I apologize. I'd love to continue the conversation. But um, before we go, uh, for folks who are interested in checking out what you guys are up to, uh, where's a great place for them to go? So you can check out our website, trainual.com, like training manual, train, U-A-L. Uh, same on Instagram or LinkedIn. And you can find me across any of the platforms just at Chris Ronzio. Great. And uh, we have that link uh, directly there below the video uh, on the show notes page. If you're out and about listening to audio, come on back to the show notes page. You can click on through and check out what the great work that Chris and his team are doing. Uh, thanks so much for being with us, Chris. Uh, absolutely fascinating conversation. Uh, you guys have made that... Uh, that turn from consulting into software really successfully. Nice, nice work. Not everyone is able to keep it on the road as the, as the, as the, uh, the curve goes there. So good job. And thanks for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being with us on this episode of the six to seven figure show. I've been your host, Frank Bria and, uh, uh, go ahead and check out uh, what Chris and his team are up to, and uh, we will catch you on the next episode. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.